your internal rate of return is really, really good for the last 30 or 40 years he's been running your business. But then God said to him, but what about your eternal rate of return? And he said, you know, he was confused. And what God said to him is like, you know, your financial metrics are off the chart. They're fantastic. You've been so blessed. But as far as eternity is concerned, what kind of an asset are you? You know, if God was going to invest in you, what kind of return would he get? Do you take money out of God's pocket, so to speak? Or do you put money in? Are you a good asset? And so that's what I want to talk to you about tonight is what is your eternal rate of return? And what is your perspective on that? Have you ever thought about that? Have you ever considered whether or not the investment that God has put in you financially, emotionally, over time, you know, what Jesus did on the cross, the, the kindness and love that God shows you and I, how good an investment return do we provide the Lord? And see, most people don't think in these terms, but you know, God is not a God that does things haphazardly or without reason. He does things for a purpose. And towards the end of this message, I'm going to show you what Jesus considered to be the eternal rate of return. You want to see, you want to see how Jesus thinks about what he came to do. But I want to start over here, and I want to show you a couple of things uh, as we get into this. In Deuteronomy 7, God is talking to Israel, and he says to them here, Deuteronomy 7, verse 6, it says, For you are a holy people to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for himself, a special treasure above all the peoples on the face of the earth. So it says a couple of things. It says, you are a holy people. Now, this word holy, people think it's, you know, it's a misunderstanding because we see holy as you're an angel in the cloud, you're playing a harp. That's not what holy means. Holy simply means set apart, different from, different to others. That's what holy means, set apart. And you're not just set apart, you're set apart for a purpose. See, when you get married, one of the things, you know, in the traditional sense, one of the things that the, uh, one of the things that the priest will say or the preacher will say, the minister that's officiating the wedding, as part of the vows, he'll talk about you forsaking all others. In other words, when you come together with your husband or with your wife, you are choosing to be set apart. You now, by getting married, you are set apart from everyone else. Now you are married together. You become one flesh. You are no longer available to anyone else. You are holy. In that sense, you are set apart, but you're not just set apart in the sense you're in the corner by yourself. You're set apart from others because you're joined to your husband or to your wife. And what God is saying to them is you are set apart. But here's where it gets really interesting. What's the purpose of him setting them apart? He has chosen you he has, he, for you are a holy people to the Lord. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for himself, a special treasure above all the peoples on the face of the earth. In other words, he has set you apart and he's making you his special treasure and different to everyone else. And look at verse 7. He says, the Lord did not set his love on you nor choose you because you were more in number than any other people, for you were the least of all people. Wow. So then he's like, listen, it's not because you are particularly great, Israel. It's not because you were the most beautiful or the smartest or the strongest or the most in number. He's like, listen, A, God is the one that chose you. You didn't choose him. He chose you, number one. Number two, he didn't choose you because of some inherent awesomeness in you. It's because of his goodness. That's the reason he chose you. It's because his goodness is there. And, you know, what he's saying to them is, don't be prideful, Israel, that I chose you because you're somehow special. No, in fact, there was no reason for me to choose you other than my goodness. And look what it says in verse eight. It says, but because the Lord loves you, and because he would keep the oath which he swore to your fathers, the Lord has brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of bondage, from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. So it's a couple of things. Number one, he is setting them apart and calling them a treasure above everyone else. And then he's letting them know that the reason he chose them is because of his goodness, not because of theirs, and not because of any of the things that they deserved because they had some position or they had some you know, multitude of people. And then in the end, he says to them, and the reason I did this, the first bit is what he did and, and, and why, but the reason I did this is because I made a covenant with your fathers. In other words, I do what I say I'm going to do. And you know, as believers, this applies to us. Even though we are not Israel, it applies to us in the same way, because the Bible says that while we were enemies of God, Christ died for us. 
while we were enemies of God. It says that we know love because he loved us first. See, we wouldn't know what love looks like if God didn't give it to us to begin with. And if while we we're enemies, Christ died for us, it's because why? Why would God do that? It says because for, so, for God so loved the world. Well, the world is something we're supposed to stay away from, something that we're supposed to be apart from, right? We are in the world and not of the world. And yet it says that for God so loved the world, not emotionally like that was smiling at, but because of God's compassion on the world, he did what? For God so loved the world that he gave. See, love is an action, not a feeling. God gave what? His son, for what purpose? For salvation. So while we were enemies of God, while we were away from God, while we were not seeking God, all those things, God was like, I want them to come back to me. See, and it wasn't because you were good. It wasn't because you were loving. It wasn't because you responded. The time when God sent Jesus was not a time when you were seeking him. And so God's goodness is displayed through his actions. And he does it first, and he does it with unmerited favor. That's what grace is, unmerited. You did not deserve it. It's not because you were good. And so in the backdrop of all of that, he shows, uh, he shows Israel why he did what he did because of a covenant. He shows us why he does what he does because of a covenant that he makes with Jesus. And so that's the goodness of God manifested apart from feelings, apart from all the other stuff. That's the goodness of God. And so if we keep going, let's look at what God values and how you think about your eternal rate of return. What is it that God is looking for? In 2 Chronicles 16, verse 7, there's a story here. I won't, I won't get in and read it, but just look at God's mindset, what he says to Israel. He says, at the time, verse 7, he says, at the time, uh, Hanani the seer came to Asa, king of Judah, and said to him, because you have relied on the king of Syria and have not relied on the Lord your God, therefore the army of the king of Syria has escaped from your hand. In other words, he's saying because you relied on flesh to achieve this objective and you didn't go to God, you've had a poor outcome. And look at verse 8. It says, were the Ethiopians and the Lubim not a huge army with very many chariots and horsemen? Yet because you relied on the Lord, he delivered them into your hand. So he's showing them that, listen, stop looking at your own strength and your own ability for the victory. The victory is going to come when you look at and focus on the Lord and you rely on the Lord to be the gap between what you can do in the flesh and what he can do by his spirit. So he's trying to teach them, hey, stop looking at what's in the natural. But look what he says after this. It's so interesting. Look what he says after this. Verse nine, for the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong on behalf of those whose heart is loyal to him. What's this saying? It's saying those people that rely on the Lord, those people that seek the Lord, those people that are willing to put their trust in him, God's eyes are looking to and fro. Why? Because he wants to show himself strong. He wants to come through for those people. God is looking for where to invest his resources. What is your eternal rate of return? See, when you're in the investment world, they call it running the ruler over companies. So in the stock market and share, share market, there's companies that are constantly, these investment companies, it's called running the ruler over other companies. Because stock prices change every day and, and sometimes you know, some, some shares get hit really, really hard, they can lose 50% of their value in a couple of days. And so they can become bargains. And so running the ruler over them means you're sitting there going, okay, which of these companies have fallen enough in value that are still fundamentally good companies, but because of some negative shock or because some surprise thing that's not really a long-term problem, it's kind of just a short-term problem that we could potentially invest in or buy outright. You know, it's running the ruler. So, so this verse is basically saying God is looking throughout the earth. He is actively looking to and fro. He's looking for a good investment. He's running the ruler over us, thinking about who do we put our resources into? And so how attractive an investment are you for the Lord? See, because we've all been given eternal life, those of us that have turned to the Lord. So the baseline investment has already been made. But then for us to grow from there, it's really a thing about whether or not we produce a good return. And see, the church at large, when I say the church, I mean the, the, just the, the modern church has basically told us that we're supposed to just sit around and, and, and we're saved and stuck and we just wait to die. 
you know, but the Bible talks, I'm not going to share on this now. I have taught in the past, but the Bible talks about rewards. It talks about crowns. It talks about being given uh, almost a degree of, of, of reward or compensation for what you've done. See, we don't think about those things. But the question is, is does the Lord care about what we do between now and when we go to be with him? What is your return on God's investment? And would you like him to invest more into you? Because we certainly ask God for more, but are we prepared to give more back? And I know this message sounds funny because in our ears, we just think that we have no responsibility. That somehow when we get saved, it's everything that Jesus did for us, but absolutely no responsibility on our side. And the truth could not be anything further from that. If you look deeply into scripture, if you look at the way Paul lived, if you look at you know, what the disciples did, it wasn't a sense of obligation. It was a sense of duty. And so I want to show you some verses of scripture that talk about this, because I believe that many times we've been misled about what we are supposed to do for the Lord because it's been put under works. But listen, it's not works out of a sense of obligation or out of a sense of trying to get God to love us. It's a love response. When you err on the side of obedience, you're erring on the side of obedience, not because you have to, but because you're trusting God. And it says that without faith, it's impossible to please him. So let me show you. Uh, some ways to think about this to change your mindset. Look at Romans 12.1. I know you've read this before, but, but I want to point out some things for you. Romans 12.1, it says, I beseech you, I beseech you. What does that mean? I'm pleading with you. Therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. So what's he saying? I beseech you. Guys, this is serious. I'm pleading with you that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. Why is it a living sacrifice? Because you're alive, which means that you don't do it once. It's living. It's constant, right? It's a constant reawakening, a renewal, a, a course correction, a, a change in perspective, that you present yourselves a living sacrifice, holy, see that word again, set apart, set apart, which is your reasonable service. Your reasonable service. Hang on a second. I thought that if I give some money to the church and maybe I volunteer from time to time in the parking lot, or maybe I'm, you know, on the usher group, or maybe I just help in kids church, that I'm amazing. God, yes, I'm so serving you. And he's saying, listen, you need to present your body a living sacrifice and holy, and that is your reasonable service. If you look up that word reasonable, it's, it's the, the root word of that is the word logic. In other words, it's just your logical service. In other words, if you realize what God did for you on the cross and how much Jesus paid and the fact that he did that at a time when you weren't seeking him and you weren't loving him, the logical outcome, the, the mindset that should flow from that is, well, you're now a living sacrifice. See, in order for you to have a good eternal rate of return, you have to be a living sacrifice. In, in fact, some of the qualifying criterias for becoming a Christian, Jesus said, if anyone would come after me, let him first deny himself, pick up his cross, and follow me. In other words, you have to die to yourself. You have to be a living sacrifice just to get started, right? That's why it's your reasonable service or your logical service. And yet we've, we've had our, our, our responsibilities so dulled down as believers that we, we think that anything we do for the Lord is, is somehow a massive thing. And it's not. And I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to uh, uh, criticize or, or make people feel bad. That's not the purpose of this. The purpose of this is to wake us up and to realize that actually there's, there's God's part, which he's already done, and then there's our part. And our part consists of a few different things. But the one thing we have to realize is that, A, we have a job to do. B, he's empowered us to do it. And C, he's rooting for us and waiting for us. And right, he's looking to and fro. And he's like, all right, I've given you everything you need, I've empowered you, and now I've commissioned you, and now I'm going to work with you. See, everything that God does, he does through people because, see, when God selected Israel, he tells them it's part of the reason is because it fulfills the covenant that I made to the fathers. And because he's fulfilling that covenant, he has to do it. He doesn't have a choice. He has to fulfill that covenant. But in fulfilling the covenant, there's, there's things that he has to do. There's actions that he has to take. He has responsibilities for us. And so in the same way, we have responsibilities. We have a love response for God as a result of the covenant that we've made when we enter into relationship with the Lord through what Jesus did. So our mind has to be renewed. Our mind has to be renewed. Well, what does that mean? 
right? Starting again, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service, and, and, not separate, and because of this, do not be conformed to this world, don't think like this world thinks, but be transformed, become a new thing, a new creature, by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. In other words, you now, now that you're a living sacrifice, now you have to think like a living sacrifice. You have to value things like a living sacrifice would value. And, you know, over these last couple of weeks, I've gotten in touch with people and heard from people that are really struggling with this mindset. Now, they don't think of it in these terms, but they're challenged by their circumstances. They're challenged by what they're seeing or not seeing. They're challenged by expecting God to do something. And when it's not happening the way that they would expect, it is putting a wedge between them and God. It is making them question the goodness of God. And what that shows you, when, when a circumstance gets between you and God, it tells you that the reason that you were in it was never for God. It wasn't because your great love for him. It's because of what he could do for you. Now, I'm not saying that you can't have expectations, that you can't have hope. I mean, you should have those things that you, you believe that God's going to come through. But you shouldn't hang your relationship with God on whether or not a prayer gets answered in your timing or in your way. See, we've made it very much a transactional relationship where we say, well, God, I'll follow you as long as things are going good. And when things aren't going good, well, where are you? It's exactly what the disciples said in the boat. You know, when Jesus is sleeping in the midst of the storm and he, he, they come to him and go, don't you care that we perish? What kind of a rude insult is that? It's the God of the universe. Don't you care that we perish? Of course he cares. He's, he's, he's about to sacrifice himself for all mankind. Yeah, he cares that you perish. But guess what? You're not perishing. But see, in their mind, if they weren't safe, they didn't care about Jesus. They, they wanted to be safe. And so oftentimes... When we renew our mind, we start to see with the eyes that God sees with. We start to value things with God's value. And so being a living sacrifice means also being willing to change your value system. See, the way that we would measure success in the life of a Christian may be very different to the way that God would measure. And so for, for us, as we, are, we're, as we are gauging our eternal rate of return to the Lord, we have to change what we value. We have to change the way that we see things. Our eye has to change. And has to see things the way that the Lord sees it. Let me show you something in Luke 17. It's interesting. Luke 17, verse 1. He's talking to the disciples. He says, then he said to the disciples, Jesus speaking, it is impossible that no offenses should come, but woe to him through whom they do come. In other words, he's saying, look, people are going to get offended, but don't let you be the one that, that causes the offense. Verse 2, it would be better for him if a millstone was hung around his neck and he was thrown into the sea than that he should offend one of these little ones. Take heed to yourselves. If your brother sins against you, rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive him. And if he sins against you seven times in a day, and seven times in a day returns to you saying, I repent, you shall forgive him. And the apostle said to the Lord, increase our faith. What's he saying? He's saying, listen, you've got to be a forgiveness machine. <laughs> you've got to be, if someone comes to you and just keeps messing up, but they keep repenting, you've got to keep forgiving them. And their response is, Lord, increase our faith. In other words, like, we have to really believe that you mean this in order for us to be able to die to ourselves and be a living sacrifice and accept someone constantly screwing up and us to be able to truly forgive. We actually have to have faith for that. See, forgiveness is not an act of your feelings. It's an act of your will. But see, if you're a living sacrifice, you don't mind forgiving over and over and over. But if you're not a living sacrifice, then it'll bother you. And this is something that is challenging. Like I struggle to see people make the same mistakes over and over again, especially when you've told them because they suffer and they also make you suffer. And you just think, why? If you would just not do that thing, it wouldn't be so bad. And you know what the Lord's saying is, listen, if you're a living sacrifice, if your mindset is to see like he sees, then if they come, you know, he's, he's obviously, uh, you know, taking it to an extreme, but he's, he's basically saying to them, there is no limit to forgiveness. If people are genuinely repenting, there is no limit to forgiveness. And then, and their response is not, I don't want to. Their response is, Lord, if you, that's your standard, if that's what you want, we need increase our faith. In other words, I have to really believe, Lord, that you are the rewarder, that you're the rewarder of me. 
See, for us to be able to forgive people that much, it's actually to do with our relationship with the Lord, not to do with our relationship with the person that's causing the problem. See, but yet when people mess up and when they upset us or they do something against us, we look to them to be the ones to make it right. And yet Jesus is not even considering the person that's messing up. He's talking to his disciples and saying, here is how you respond. It's got nothing to do with the other person. And they understood this because their response to him was, help us to have a deeper relationship with you, Lord. It's not about the other person. Because to the degree that you know that God loves you, you can give love to others. You know, and Jesus talks about that parable and he says, he says, he who has been forgiven much loves much. In other words, when you recognize how good God has been in your life, then you're willing to extend that goodness to others. And that's what these disciples are saying. They understood by what Jesus told them that if they're going to actually have a relationship with him and live and walk this out, it's really a, a testament to the relationship they have with God. And then look at this. This is, this is key, right? Watch what Jesus said after this. Verse six. So the Lord said, if you have faith, as a mustard seed, you can say to this mulberry tree, be pulled up by the roots and be planted in the sea, and it would obey you. So what's he, what's he making the object of? See, they said, increase our faith. And then he says to them, if you have faith as a mustard seed. In other words, they're asking for more faith. And he's saying, you don't need a lot of faith. It's not about having additional faith. He's just saying, if you use the faith that you have, there's supernatural power in that in other words he's telling them don't use faith as an excuse or, or lack of faith as an excuse for not forgiving your brother and then look what he says this is this kills me when i read this it's just it's such a different perspective right verse seven he says and again and you always got to see these conjunctions and is always along with what he just said and which of you having a servant plowing or tending sheep will say to him when he has come in from the field, come at once and sit down to eat. He's contrasting now. He's saying, because he's talking about faith, right? But he's contrasting. He's saying, if you've got a servant and you've sent him out all day into the field and he's working hard, once that servant comes home, you just say to him, hey, servant, you've done a great job. Put your feet up, right? In our society, we would say yes. But look what Jesus says, verse 8. But will he not rather say to him, prepare something for my supper and gird yourself and serve me till I have eaten and drunk and afterward you will eat and drink? In other words, he's saying, even though the servant has worked hard all day and done all those things, no, he has to still continue to serve his master when he gets home. And then look at verse 9. Does he thank that servant because he did the things that were commanded him? I think not. <laughs> what's jesus saying he's saying listen when the servant comes and does all those things the master's not like oh thank you you've worked so hard in the field and hey you've served me and you haven't even eaten yet thank you jesus says, no no why not why not what he says verse 10 so likewise you when you have done all those things which you are commanded, say, we are unprofitable servants. We have done what was our duty to do. What do you mean? What do you mean? I think it's pretty clear. What Jesus is saying is, listen, you have a job to do. When you do the things that you've been commanded to do, you're just doing what's required of you. See, people will say, well, you know, I went to church on Sunday and then, you know, then I helped someone and then, you know, then, then, then I prayed that night and I listened to some worship music in the car. And then on Monday, you know, I gave $5 to a homeless one. Oh God, I'm so overextended in this department. It's like, it's your reasonable service. You're a living sacrifice. You belong to him. And see, it's a challenging message if you live for you. But it's a freeing message if you're willing to die to yourself because it allows you to start to see with God's perspective. Now, does that mean that God doesn't appreciate and value what, what you do? Not at all. In fact, that's why there's rewards. That's why he will say to you, well done, good and faithful servant, right? The reason why God rewards is because he knows the value of the labor. And he says, 
that a worker is worthy of his wages. But the point is, is we are not supposed to view what we do for the Lord as an exchange. We're not supposed to view it as something that we do in order to get something from God or to move God. We see it as something that we just do naturally. Like our kids, you know, every now and then our kids will forget that they're our kids. And they'll make this statement that's absurd, like, oh, when am I going to get whatever for doing that thing? And it's like, hang on a second. Like even with Joshua today, you know, we're talking about something. And, uh, and I said, well, hang on, Joshua, did, did you eat today? It's like, yes. I'm like, you've got clothes, right? I'm like, yeah. I'm like, you're watching TV on, you know, there's electricity. He's like, yeah. I'm like, so all these things, where do you think this stuff comes from? <laughs> you know, what do you, because you're asking me paid for something, you know? And I was like, you're not getting paid for that thing. You're part of our family. You have to do that thing, you see? But in his mind, he forgets that he has responsibilities and not just privileges, right? Because his parents are good to him and because he lives a good life, he forgets that there's some things that he has to do as well. Now, of course, when he does those things, you know, he'll get a pat on the head and I'll go and encourage him. But it's like he hasn't done us a favor by, you know, making his bed or cleaning the dishes or whatever we've told him to do. That's his reasonable service. And the reason why I think this message is so important is because it's so countercultural and, and especially so counter church culture. See, in our culture, it's all about our rights. There's no responsibilities. You know, there's that, that, there's that saying from America, you know, which is ask not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. That doesn't mean anything anymore, right? No one says, you know, ask what you can do for your church, but ask what your church can do for you. When you come to church, church is all about what it can do for you. When you're inviting your friends to church, what, is, what, is, what does the typical church tell you? Oh, tell them to come. You know, we've got great connect groups. We've got great coffee. You know, we're a friendly bunch of people. We're this, we're this. You know, here's all the reasons why people should come because they're going to be served. And yet our life as believers is a life of service, not a life to be served. We've already been served because of what Jesus did on the cross. We've already been served by the, the way that we've been empowered by the Lord. We've been served already. That doesn't mean that we can't pray and ask God to, to help us along or to do things for us. We can. There are places for that. But, but our life is not one of being served. It's a life of service. See, because we're not supposed to be Christians for us. We're supposed to be Christians for him. Because Christian is just an imitator of Jesus. And because the church is so hung up on being liked and being accepted and, and being relevant, it's made the life of a Christian all about what we can get out of God rather than how much he can get out of us into this world. See, we are here to represent him, not to represent ourselves. We are here to give him a good return on his investment. We are here to give him a good outcome for what he's put into us. See, because when God is knocking at, your, at the door of your heart and you open up and he comes in, there is nothing that he can't do through you if you'll allow him. But he can't do it until you are ready to give up what you want out of this life and to come to him for what he wants out of this life for you and through you. And because we've been told that we have no responsibility, no accountability, there's nothing in it. It's just God, you're here to love me and bless me and you're here to serve me. And it's like, that's not at all what the disciples view of it, what Jesus's view of it. And what Jesus is saying here in verse 9, he says, So likewise you, when you've done all the things you are commanded, say, we are unprofitable servants, we have done what was our duty to do. In other words, when you obey what the Lord has told you to do, that's just the basics. That's a requirement. It's not special. You haven't done God a favor. And look what Paul says here in Timothy. He says uh, in, in uh, uh, 2 Timothy 4 verse 1, he says, I charge you. I charge you. Why? Because he's being he's saying, listen, focus on this. I charge you, therefore, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. In other words, what? Activity, right? Activity. We're meant to be doing this stuff. We're meant to be doing this stuff. With long suffering. In other words, sometimes it's going to be challenging. You know, sometimes, you know, when, when I'm sharing messages with people, the, the hardest thing is not sharing the word. The hardest thing is seeing people hear it and not apply it. And then seeing them struggle with things that the Lord wanted to show them, but because they're not willing 
to transform their mind, to change their perspective, they continue to suffer the same things. That's the toughest thing about sharing the word. It's not the, the, the preparing of the message. It's not, you know, speaking it out. It's not those things. It's, it's keeping your heart soft in saying, you know what? I'm going to have to just share that again. Like you will not believe, you know, obviously I've been doing this now with you guys for, I don't know, probably two and a half years or something like that. There's a hundred and maybe 10, 15, 20 messages on YouTube. I've taught on so many things. And people that I know, were because I was looking at them the same way I'm looking at people right now, they were in that meeting. And they'll come back and go, I never knew that. I'm like, yes, you did. But you didn't apply it in your life. And that's why you're shocked now when this thing is happening. It's like the Lord, and this is the challenge going to be for us, brothers and sisters, when we get up to heaven, we'll say, say to the Lord, you know, why didn't you tell me that? Or I didn't know that. And then you'll be able to rewind. He'll go to YouTube and you'll click on the link and be like, that Thursday night, Rudy shared that, right? Now, I'm just joking. But you know what I'm saying? Like, the Lord is giving you those things, but if you're not willing to shift off that where you are, then you're going to suffer for it. And that's the hardest thing for me, just as, as, as ministering to you, because I genuinely love you and care for you. I really do. And it's like, man, if you just get that, because it's not me speaking to you, it's the Lord speaking to you. It's the living word. And so I want to encourage you to get out of this mindset of being served by the Lord and into a mindset of, Lord, what can I do? How can I give you an eternal rate of return? Watch this, verse 3. Because he's telling them what? He's telling them, convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. In other words, help people to get this message. Verse three, for the time will come. In other words, because here's what's going to happen. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. In other words, what? Listen, right now, you guys need to go and spread this gospel, spread the work, rebuke, exhort. In other words, encourage, help them to change, help them to, be, to, to, to have the right word coming into them because there's going to become a time when they're not even going to listen to you. In fact, they're going to, they're going to gravitate towards the ministers and the teachers that tell them exactly what they want to hear. And when they get those people in their lives that tell them those things, they're not even going to listen to the truth anymore. And that's where we are today. In the Christian context, if you try and share with people just biblical truth, like what I'm sharing tonight, most people will reject this. Why? Because of what teachers have told them for decades. Oh, God loves you. He wants you to have a good life. He wants you to be blessed. He wants just the best for you. For I know the plans that I have for you, says the Lord. You know, all this stuff, right? And so we've just, we've, we've been told. Why? Why have we been told that? Because the church wants you to come and it knows that people are inherently selfish. And instead of helping them get free of that selfishness, it panders to the selfishness. It tells them all the reasons why God is going to make their life better and why coming to church is going to serve them. And what it does is it stops them being a living sacrifice. See, when you become a living sacrifice, it's not about you and what you can get out of it. It's what you can do for others. See, love your God and love your neighbor as yourself has nothing to do with you. Love your God and love your neighbor. See, love your God or love is a verb and love your neighbor, love is a verb. So therefore, none of that has anything to do with what you're going to get out of it. And yet that's all we're called to do. And that's what the Old Testament was all about when they asked Jesus, you know, what, what's, what's the greatest commandment? He tells them, love your God and then love your neighbor. He's like it. And he says, on these two hang all the law and the prophets. In other words, the, 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 the basis of the Old Testament law, if you want to look at what fulfills that, it's that loving God and loving your neighbor. And none of those things are to do with you getting anything out of it. Amen? And yet the church comes and says, come to church because your life will be better. And oftentimes people's lives are not better. And then they get disappointed because they got sold this thing of, oh, come and be a Christian and, and everything will be fantastic. And that's just not how it works. See, when you realize what you are made to be and what your purpose is, your mindset shifts and how you value this world and this life and what you're called to do changes drastically and it frees you from you. The purpose of Jesus coming was not to make your life better. It was to free you from you. It was to free you from the selfishness inherent in every one of us because we are born of Adam. And then look what he says. After all this in verse five, he says, but you be watchful in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. None of those things are to do with you. He starts off by saying, listen, go out and do the work. Exhort, rebuke, encourage, do all this stuff because the time is short. People are not going to listen. 
And then after he says that, then he says, keep doing the stuff, right? And endure afflictions. People are going to reject you. Endure. None of that is about you having a good life. Isn't that great? No, not if you're not, not if you're not submitted. It's not great. Man, if you can be if you can catch this, if you can catch this, if you can understand God's mindset and you can get free from you, I promise you it's the best thing you'll ever do. Because you can have all the stuff in the world and be in a prison. I tell you, some of the wealthiest people are the most imprisoned people. They can't share what they think. They can't be honest. They don't control. I know. I mean, there's people that I know. Their schedule is 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 booked out two years in advance. If you want to go and see them, you got to wait two years. Now you imagine having the world. However, you want to. You know, it could be your company. It could be the government. It could be. It doesn't matter. But you're you're so scheduled that your next two years are planned out. What a horrible way to live. I mean, you think about that. You are owned. And why do you do it? Why do you do it? What's your value system? What is the eternal rate of return for a soul like that that has no room for God and has no room for people? And it's all about what can I get out of this life? Maybe in the moment they feel okay, but I tell you, over time, they're not going to make a good investment for the Lord. And so look at, look at what Paul is saying here after he says all this in verse 6. For I am already being poured out as a drink offering and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Notice this consistency. He's fought the good fight. See, a fight is not one and done. A fight is constant. I have finished the race. A race is not won through one step. It's a race. It takes time. I have kept the faith. Why do you need to keep it? Because over time, you're going to struggle. He has kept the faith. And then look what he says. Finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on that day. And not to me only, but to all those who have loved his appearing. Paul is looking forward to a reward, to a prize, to a crown because of what he has done in the name of the Lord. And see, again, you can, you can be so, so sucked into this, this feeling like, well, are we just robots here serving God? No. It's because of what's happened. See, when you accepted, or, or, or I should better say, when you were accepted into God's family and you became a child of God, you now have to look like him, talk like him, act like him, and fulfill the purpose of why he adopted you in the first place. But because we look at it the other way, and this is the problem with the, with the, with the terminology that the modern church uses for the born-again experience, and it's really a salvation experience, it's you welcome Jesus into your heart. In other words, you positionally don't move. You just bring Jesus in. Now, I know you'll say that's semantics, but it's really not. Because what it teaches people is that you are still you. You live the same way, but Jesus just comes along the journey with you. Instead of saying, no, actually, you join Jesus's family. You join God's family, and you no longer live the way you used to live. You've positionally changed. You now have a new nature. All things have passed away. Behold, all things are new. In other words, you're not this person anymore. This person's gone. But what we've taught people is you're still the same person. And Jesus just comes along for the journey and makes everything better. He's like a little butler that you can ask for things and he fixes your problems. And he heals you from time to time and he makes money appear in your wallet. And when it doesn't, we just say, well, God works in mysterious ways. Smile, come to church. What, what nonsense. That is not the gospel. That is not what Jesus taught. That's not what the disciples believed. And you can see that evidence by their lives. It's not what Paul believed. Look at what he keeps teaching. Long-suffering, endurance, patience. And brothers and sisters, I love you enough to tell you the truth. And I'm not saying that the church is doing this on purpose. Oftentimes, they're ignorant. But if you just read your Bible, you can see for yourself what the purpose of a Christian is. It's realizing that you were never made for this world. You were never made to live the life that you were living. You were never created to serve yourself. You're created to be in relationship with the Lord. And when you're in relationship with the Lord, then you start to look like Him. You start to see like Him. You start to value like Him. So all the things that you do then line up with God's will. And then you're in perfect peace because you know that no matter what happens, you're following the Lord. And this is what erring on the side of obedience is. It's you being in that place where you just go, Lord, if I'm hearing your voice, even if I'm wrong, I'm going to err on the side of doing what you call me to do. And because I love you and because you love me and because I can hear your voice, even if I miss it, you'll be able to speak to me again and I'll correct it. But I want to please you. I want to honor you. 
in everything I do, in the small and in the big. And so Jesus had this mentality. And I want to show you uh, in this last bit, and it's a bit of reading, but just stick with me. Look at Jesus's view on this. This is his eternal rate of return. And this, this is titled Jesus Prays for Himself. But, but watch this, right? This is going to be challenging for some of you. This is in John 17. Jesus spoke these words, lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son that your son also may glorify you as you have given him authority over all flesh that he should give eternal life to as many as you have given him. What's he saying? The hour has come. It means there was an hour. It means that Jesus was looking forward. See, he's speaking to the Father about an event that he knew is coming. Jesus wasn't taking every day one step at a time. Jesus was working towards something. And Jesus knew that he had been given something. What had he been given? He'd been given eternal life. And he then needs to give that eternal life to others. See, Jesus wasn't haphazard. He says, I only do what I see my father do. And yet we think that Jesus is just walking around doing random things, you know, doing miracles, multiplying fish, cleansing lepers. No, no, no. Jesus came for a purpose. And he says here, this is so beautiful. If you watch this in John 17, he's sharing with the father that he should give eternal life to as many as you've given in verse three. And this is eternal life that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. So he's saying that eternal life is not getting your Prayers answered, eternal life is knowing God and being in relationship with Him. That's eternal life. Eternal life's not going to heaven. You can have eternal life here on earth. That's what He says. He should give eternal life to as many as He's given Him. Verse 4, I have glorified you on the earth. I have finished the work which you have given me to do. And now, O oh Father, glorify me together with yourself with the glory which I had with you before the world was. What's Jesus saying? I have done the job that you've given me to do. What makes us think that if Jesus had a job to do, we don't have a job to do? What makes us think that if God had stuff for Jesus to do, that he's got nothing for us to do? Because the Bible talks about us following Jesus. It talks about doing the works that he did. It talks about why do you call me Lord, Lord, and you not do the things I say? If you love me, keep my commandments. It's all this stuff about us responding to the teachings of Jesus and then going out and doing it. The Great Commission, we treat it as the Great Suggestion. It's not. The Great Commission is a commission. He's sending us out. It's an order. He even orders us to love, right? I mean, there's so many things that we've, we've taught on even the last few weeks. So I want to encourage you. Look at Jesus' perspective on how he sees his own work. How does Jesus think about what he's done? When he has finished running his race, we, we just read before in Timothy what Paul was saying about I've run the race. This is Jesus saying, I've run the race. This is Jesus' perspective on the race that he run. And I know that sounds kind of funny because you think, well, Jesus was God. Yeah, but he was God in the flesh and he had a purpose. He had a reason for coming on the earth. And look what he says. I've done the work. God, the job you gave me to do, the job description, I fulfilled it. And now, look at this, what he says, verse 5. And now, Father glorify me together with yourself with the glory which I had before the world was. What you have to understand is that Jesus, when he came to earth, he shed his glory that he had as God and he equated himself with man. Yes, he was fully God in his spirit, but he was fully man in his flesh. And so Jesus actually submitted himself under God. He was less than in the sense of he didn't have his full glory. Yes, the spirit was God's, but he, he submitted himself to the Father. That's why he prayed to God, even though he himself was God in the flesh. He submitted himself. And now what he's saying is, because of what I've done, Lord, because I have glorified you, because I have fulfilled what you've called me to do, now restore me to the glory that I had before. It's the reward for Jesus for a job well done. Crazy. Have you ever thought about that? We have a job to do, brothers and sisters, and you've been lied to. You've been told you've got nothing to do. And it's a lie of the enemy because the enemy knows that once you're free from you and you couple that with the power of God, you become like Jesus and you stomp hell for a living. You become the devil's worst nightmare. But if you think that you have nothing to do and you just hang out and wait to die and hopefully get a couple of prayers answered, great. Everything Jesus came to do stops with you. Look at this in verse 6. I have manifested your name to the men whom you have given me out of the world. 
In other words, I did what you told me to do. They were yours. You gave them to me and they have kept your word. Now they have known that all things which you have given me are from you. For I have given to them the words which you have given me and they received them. And they have known surely that I came forth from you and they believe that you have sent me. What did God do? God gave Jesus some resources, right? Human resources. And then Jesus did what? The job that he was told to do, right? He tells you, he says there, Father, you gave me these people. They came out of the world. You told me some words. I shared those words with them as I was told as part of my job description. And now look, now they believe it and they're running with it. So he's saying, hey, I did exactly what you set out for me to do. Isn't that crazy? It's like, it's like Jesus is having a performance review with God and listing all the steps. You know, when I used to work in corporate world, once a year, we'd have performance reviews. And you'd go through, here was the object, objectives that your boss had for you at the start of the year. And then you would go through and talk about all the things that you actually did. You know, on, you know, in this area, did you do? Yeah, I did that. I did that. Oh, okay, I missed this thing, you know? And then at the end, you would get, you know, a salary increase or a bonus or a promotion or something else, which was as a result of whether or not you did the stuff. And that's literally what this looks like. It's like Jesus is, is kind of evaluating the things that he did before the Lord. And I know that sounds funny, but that's what he's doing. What makes us think that the Lord doesn't have this for us? And it shouldn't be onerous, brothers and sisters. It should be a sense of, of, of just, such a joy. Like, you know, when, I, when Thursday night comes around, I don't dread it. I love it. This is why if I'm traveling anywhere in the world, I'll get up two, three, four in the morning. I hate mornings. It's the worst thing in the world. But when I get up and it's three in the morning and I know you guys are coming on, I'm pumped. It's not a dread. It's a joy. Why? Because I care about you, because I love you, because I love sharing the word with you. I am energized. I'm more pumped at the end of the night than I am at the start. It's not a bother or a pain. It's such a joy because, man, God was so gentle and patient with me for me to get some of this stuff that for me to share it with you is nothing. It's easy because it's such a joy because I'm so thankful to the Lord. Watch what Jesus says here. Some of this stuff will spin you out. Look at this, verse 9. I pray for them. Who's he talking about? I pray for them. I do not pray for the world, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours. Ooh, Jesus is not praying for the world. He's praying for us. He's praying for the disciples. Ah, oh, but Jesus loves everyone. No. No, he says, I'm not praying for the world. In other words, the world is the world. I'm interested in my brothers and sisters. I'm interested in the ones you've given. me. God so loved the world that he gave, not that he felt. And I've taught on this, you know, a few weeks ago. You know, does God love the world? Yes, he loved them in the sense of he gave, but not that he has good feelings about the world. In fact, the whole Bible is about staying away from the world, being in the world, but not of the world. But all this stuff, because again, I keep going back to the church model because it's just so true. Because they need volume and they need people and butts on seats. They just tell them whatever will bring them in. And that's not, that's not what the Bible teaches. You can love people in the sense of doing the things that will help them, but not like what they do. And certainly don't go and be like them. Verse 9, I pray for them. I do not pray for the world. But for those whom you have given me, for they are yours. And all mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I am glorified in them. Verse 11, now I am no longer in the world, but these, the people I've left behind, are in the world. And I come to you, Holy Father. Keep through your name those you have given me, that they may be one as we are. He's praying for them. While I was with them in the world, verse 12, I kept them in your name. Those whom you gave me, I have kept, and none of them is lost except the son of perdition that the scripture might be fulfilled. In other words, everything that you set out for me, I have done, and I've done it correctly. I haven't lost one, except for one, but I can explain. <laughs> what he's saying is the one that I lost, I lost because the scripture had to be fulfilled. In other words, it wasn't a mistake. Judas had to be fulfilled because it was foretold. It was one of the prophecies. So he's saying to God, listen, every single one that you gave me, I have done what you told me to do and I fulfilled my calling. But now he's saying, listen, I'm leaving, Lord, and I still care about these people. He's praying for them. Verse 13, but now I come to you and these things I speak in the world that they may, be, that they may, that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them your word and the world has hated them because they are not of the world just as I am not of the world. 
I do not pray, watch this, I do not pray that you should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil one. In other words, we're all trying to escape. God, please, Lord Jesus, come. And what Jesus is saying, no, no, no. God, I, I don't want you to, I want you to leave them in the world, but I just want you to protect them from the enemy. Verse 16, they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. As you have sent me into the world, look, I have I also have sent them into the world, and for their sakes I sanctify myself, that they also may be sanctified by the truth. I should spend all night just teaching on this passage, but look what he's saying. He's saying, Lord, I'm leaving. Look after them. I love them, and I don't want them leaving the world. I want them staying here. See, every Christian is praying for the second coming. Jesus, come, take us out. Why? Because we're selfish. And he's saying, stay here because you are what I've left over. If you don't represent me, people won't see God. The only time they're going to see God is in you and in me, brothers and sisters. And never, he's, never going to, he's never going to be able to do that through you and I unless we are submitted and a living sacrifice. Because then we're willing to do what God calls us to do when he calls us to do it. Instead of saying, I'm too busy, I've got my own life. Here. Jesus doesn't want you out of this world. He wants you in this world so people can see the goodness of God through you. Even the prayers that we pray are selfish prayers. Because we haven't understand the purpose of us being on this earth. Verse 20, I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. In other words, what? You and I. Those verses above were about the disciples, but he's saying now, I'm also making a future prayer for anyone else that's a believer. And look what he says. Why? What's the purpose behind the Verse 21, that they may all be as one as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. In other words, when you follow the teachings of Jesus and you are one with him and with the Father, the world sees evidence that God is real and that Jesus came because of the transformation in us. You see? The world will believe that you sent me. In other words, man, this Jesus must be real because look at his disciples. Look at what they're like. Verse 22, And the glory which you've given me, I've given them, that they may be just as we are one. I in them, and you in me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that you sent me and have loved them as you've loved me. The whole purpose of this is prayer. Jesus is saying, listen, if people get this, excuse me, if people get this reality that they are in me and in you, and all of us are together, they become like us. And then the world sees and the world believes that I was actually sent, and that this is the real deal. See, when we behave like Jesus, God gets the glory, and people start to see that God is real because of our actions, because they don't match. They don't match with the world. We are here to be witnesses, whereas we've made a witness sing. Witnesses just says, this is what I've seen and how it's transformed my life. Witness sing, now you're trying to convince people. You're not there to convince people and argue them into the kingdom. You are meant to be just a representative of who Jesus is. And when people see that, they'll go, wow. See, we've tried to convince people of things that we're not convinced of ourselves. Let me finish with this. Verse 24, Father, I desire that they also whom you gave me may be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory which you've given me, for you love me before the foundation of the world. See, he wants them to be together. Why? Because that's what eternal life is. It's, it's knowing and being with the Father. Father, I desire that they also, whom you gave me, who? You and I, brothers and sisters, the disciples, everyone that, that calls on the name of the Lord, may be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory, which you've given me, for you love me before the foundation of the world. O righteous Father, the world has not known you, but I have known you. And these have known that you sent me, and I declared them to them your name, and will declare it, that the love with which you loved me may be in them, and I in them. In other words, the manifestation, the fullness of this is displayed in the love that Jesus showed us, and then the love that we show him in return. But how do we show him love in return? If you love me, keep my commandments. You see? The things that we do in response to what Jesus has called us to do, that's love. That's us showing love back to God. What is it? It's sacrifice. It's obedience. 
It's, it's erring on that side of God's voice. It's choosing to leave the house in the morning, purposely being a blessing to others. It's saying, even though I don't want to do this right now, it's, it, I'm going to do it, Lord, because you've done it for me. It's choosing to forgive when you don't want to forgive. It's choosing to be kind when that person doesn't deserve it. It's showing mercy. It's turning the other cheek. It's all the things that we've been talking about. It's being a representative of the Lord. Because when you realize that you belong in God's family, you automatically have eternal life. You have passed from death to life. And the reason you pass from death to life is because the life that you have is leading you to death. But the life that he has is leading you to eternal life. And that's why he says, Jesus says, he who seeks to save his life will lose it. He who chooses to live this way, to keep the same value system, to live for themselves, to have this mindset of this world, ultimately will lose his life eternally speaking. But he who loses his life for my sake will find it. And so your goal as a Christian, number one, is not all the stuff out there. It's getting a revelation of how much God loves you and what he did for you. And then going, all right, it is time to die. It is time to become a living sacrifice. And when you do that and you start to renew your mind and you see how he sees and you value how he values, then you're empowered to walk out this life and represent Jesus. And then you get the crown and then you get the reward and then you become the faithful servant that enters into the joy of the master. But up until that point, you're still living for you. And so your mindset has to be one of, service because of gratitude not because of obligation it has to be of a transformed nature because you've been adopted into god's family and you just need to start to look like him and whilst it takes time to renew your mind and there's a journey to go on the baseline of that is lord i am here to serve you and to be submitted to you and so therefore anything that i need to do from here onwards i am doing as unto you and whether i make it right or not whether i screw up or not whether i fall down along the way and all of us do and all of us will because I've entered into the mindset that, Lord, I am in your family, then everything that I'm doing here onwards is in the pursuit and in the search of knowing you more and being more like you. And even when you trip up and fall along the way, God is so merciful and kind because he knows that it's a journey. But we feel at peace because we realize that he's not looking at us like a, like a servant. He's looking at us like a son or like a daughter. And that's why Jesus said, I no longer call you servants. I call you my brothers. See, we are in this together with the Lord and he's empowered us and he's given us everything we need to be able to walk this life out. But it starts with being submitted and realizing that we have a responsibility, we have a job to do. And if we're going to walk like Jesus walked, we have to evaluate what is our eternal rate of return. Amen.